in all of our uh, circumstances and all of the things that goes on in our world today, we can trust in him. And this morning, I, uh, as I was preparing for the message, I thought to myself, we are definitely in perilous times. And so the whole flow of the message seemed to develop around what are the things that we can do uh, that will give us, and again, I'll uh, mention Brother Jim, uh, that will give us the confidence to go forward in the world today. And I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt, that is the love of God. I'm reminded of the story that was told. I love reading uh, uh, biographies, and one of the biographies that I enjoyed reading uh, probably the most was one about D.L. Moody. Uh, and in the book by his son-in-law, uh, Edward Mr. Fitz was his name, uh, he shared a story um, really straight from the words of D.L. Moody himself. He told the story of a young man uh, by the name of Henry Morehouse. Uh, many referred to him as Harry Morehouse, but he was born Henry Morehouse sometime in uh, the year of 1840. Uh, and uh, in his early life, he was real, um, I'll just say, a real roustabout. Uh, he would, uh, wherever he could possibly find a good uh, uh, brawl, he would be involved in that brawl. Uh, he was a member of some gangs there in Manchester area of uh, New England and uh, was just a really uh, troublesome young man. And then one day, one of his friends had heard a message uh, and preached, and this friend of his became saved. And as a result of that, his friend began to talk with him. Uh, he did not at that time embrace the faith of Christ at that time, but as years went by, things started happening. And uh, he went by a circus tent, and inside that circus tent was a lot of things going on. He actually thought that it may be a brawl that he would love to get involved in, so he went inside, and God had an appointment with him. The message that was being preached at that time was a message of the love of God. And he, at that time, uh, accepted Christ. Uh, later, he became involved in, in uh, uh, the work of the Lord and felt the call uh, to preach. And so I um, began to preach. Now, he was a uh, beardless, according to the story, a beardless uh, man, oftentimes mistaken to be much younger than what he actually was. Uh, he came to D.L. Moody as D.L. Moody was visiting there in England one time and said, I'd love to go back with you to the United States and preach for you. And D.L. Moody looked at him and said, uh, thought in his mind, uh, again from the words of D.L. Moody himself, he said he thought to himself, this little young whippersnapper, surely he can't preach. And uh, so he just kind of passed it off. And so D.L. Moody went back to the U.S. and, and uh, got a letter from uh, Henry Morehouse. And in that letter, Henry asked him again, I'd love to come and I'd love to preach there in Chicago. And so uh, D.L. Moody wrote back and said, well, if you come this way, just uh, drop by and say hi. And he put him off for a while and eventually ex allowed him uh, to preach. Uh, he stood on the first night there in Chicago and brought a message from John 3.16. For God so loved the world. And in that one verse, he brought an enormous message. In fact, D.L. Moody was not able to be there on that first night. He asked his wife how the message went. And his wife said, you've got to hear this young man. And so he went the next night thinking that he's going to hear a message uh, preached someplace other than John 3.16. And the man stood and he said, I'd like for all of you to turn to the uh, third chapter of John and the 16th verse. Henry Morehouse did that for six consecutive nights and packed the audience every single night with a different message relating to the love of God. Now, the interesting thing is, uh, Mr. Moody uh, uh, began to think to himself, surely he's got something else that he can preach on. And so he came back the, sec the seventh night, and uh, the, uh, as he stood to begin the night's message, he said these words, My friends, for a whole week I've been trying to tell you how much God loves you, but I cannot do it with this poor stammering tongue. If I could borrow Jacob's ladder, 
and climb up into heaven and ask Gabriel, who stands in the presence of the Almighty, if he could tell me how much love the Father has for the world, all he could say would be, please turn to John 3.16, for God so loved the world. And there's so much truth in that. As we go through these uh, uh, perilous times in our life, and folks, uh, our nation has gone through perilous times before. And oftentimes those perilous times brings great revival across our land. And that's my prayer, that all these things that are happening, that there will be a great revival that will start across our nation. And I am convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt that across this nation, congregations no different than what our congregation is is going to stand firm for the word of god and again i've mentioned earlier today how much i'm thankful for our pastor that stands every single sunday and delivers the truth from god's word and we're blessed uh, to have that and so this morning as we consider john 3:16. Uh, and, and the whole concept of the love of God, I'd like to begin by saying that the, uh, the love of God was announced first in the Garden of Eden. And I think we'll all uh, understand uh, the importance of what took place there uh, in the Garden. In Genesis, the third chapter, verse 15, we're told that uh, the plan of God was uh, that, uh, uh, that there was going to be a time where the, that Satan's um, uh, head would be crushed and the heel of Christ will be bruised. Uh, that crushing of the head indicates a total destruction of the ways of God. And that love of God is what brought that about. So let's think a, a few minutes about what took place there in the garden that propelled us into the concept or the doctrine of salvation that comes from the true love of God. The fact of the matter is, I will say first, Sin is real. There's no doubt about that. I believe all of us would agree with that. In fact, James, the first chapter, verse 14 and 15, uh, talks about it. It says, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then with that uh, lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. Sin is real. That word that in the King James Bible that's translated there, lust, could be uh, uh, better understood in our own terms today of a desire. It begins with that desire. This past Wednesday night, as we were looking at the uh, second of a number of commandments of Christ from the book of Matthew, uh, we looked there and the, uh, the, what we saw there was uh, first the first commandment was repent and the second commandment of Christ was to follow me. And uh, in that discussion we talked about there in the Garden of Eden in that uh, third chapter of the book of Genesis. And we saw there uh, that there were four D's. And we talked about the four D's that leads oftentimes to sin uh, in our life. Uh, that first one that we uh, considered was the word doubt. And it begins, uh, even as the book of James, the first chapter here indicates, it begins as just a little small seed, right? I mean, think about it, there in the garden, uh, in the third chapter, verse 2 and 3, Satan came to Eve and just planted that little bit of a doubt. I mean, you remember the words there. He said uh, to Eve, oh, come on. Uh, now, didn't God say that you could partake of any of the fruit on any of the trees in the garden? And it's interesting to uh, note that uh, it did place that seed of doubt into Eve's mind. Because remember, during that uh, uh, conversation, Eve even added just a little bit, didn't she? She said, uh, uh, well, yeah, he did say uh, that we could eat of any of the trees except for this tree. And she went on to say then, and we're not even to touch it. And if we were to go back and we were to see, God never said anything about touching it. He said, partaking of that tree... So the doubt had been placed in Eve's mind. I want to tell you this morning, as we go through our life, even today, I believe this progression of sin, and sin is real, this progression of sin begins as Satan places these seed thoughts in our mind that leads us to that doubt. And then uh, the second D that we considered was the word denial. 
Uh, we saw there in the fourth verse, uh, uh, Satan just came to Eve and just point blank said, come on now, you won't really die. I mean, he literally denied the truth of God's word. And so uh, that doubt began. And then after doubt, uh, I've shared with you before how that Satan will oftentimes look at your spiritual eyes as you're going through life. And if he can cause your spiritual eyes to deviate any way, left or right, he thinks he has you on the run. And then he leads you to a point where he will convince you to totally deny the truth of God's word. And once he has that, uh, then he can begin to work on the third D, and that third D is desire. And so we have doubt, denial, desire. And uh, you remember it was at that point that uh, Satan convinced uh, uh, Eve to look again at it, and she looked and she saw that it was good for food. She began to desire that piece of fruit. And then finally, the last day, that disobedience that occurred as she partook of that fruit and gave it unto Adam. And so you, and, and if, as I have looked in my own life, and as I've studied God's word and gone through different uh, instances of sin uh, that has occurred in God's word, uh, it's almost like it, it does seem to follow that pattern. And so oftentimes I have to uh, ask myself, okay, with regard to a question that I may have in my mind as to whether or not it's right uh, in the eyes of God to participate in an activity, I stop and I ask myself, where am I in this progression? Is it doubt? Have I came to a point where I'm willing to deny the truth of God's word? And if so, then uh, am I desiring to, to participate in this activity or do whatever it is I'm considering? Uh, and yet, at the same time, I can stand firm on God's word and not disobey and then turn firmly toward, uh, toward God. I think, again, each of us would agree. And, uh, you know, sin is a folly, uh, and, and that folly will deceive you. There's no doubt about it. Uh, sin is a force that will destroy you. It's a fact that we will denounce you. And all of it started back there in the Garden of Eden. And we have to learn to deal with it in the way in which God would have us to through His Son, Jesus Christ. As I studied there in the book of Genesis and I saw all those things that was taking place, uh, there was a, a couple of things that kept uh, just coming up in my mind as I would counsel, uh, particularly with young married couples. And they would come and they would begin to share with me uh, uh, the difficulties of, of the things that was going on in their life. In fact, I remember sitting down with one young couple, great, great couple of the Lord uh, in our church. And uh, when they arrived there at our home, I had uh, two notepads uh, sitting on the table and two piece, uh, pencils there. Uh, and I looked at them and I said, tonight as we begin our session together, what I would like for you to do is I would like for you to just begin to list the times in which your spouse has troubled you or has uh, broken rights that you think that you have. And buddy, I no sooner got the words out of my mouth that the young lady picked it up, and I mean, she was writing a novel. <laughs> I looked across at the young man, and in absolute fright and panic, he looked at me and said, what did I do? What, what did I do? And I said, no, no, we're, we're, we're not looking at what you did. We are supposed to be writing down times when you feel like that your rights has been violated. And he said, yeah, but look at her. She's still writing, you know, and so it concerned him. And through that process, I, dis I discovered that all the way back in the book of Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, there's basically two fears, that uh, one fear that man deals with and one fear that woman deals with. And I believe it goes back to that first sin. Because as I began to counsel with this person, uh, there was this, um, this young man uh, was just beginning in his uh, work of the Lord in the ministry. And uh, there was a true fear of failure that, that began to develop in his heart. 
And so what he did in order to, um, uh, to uh, work with that fear, to be able to overcome that fear, uh, what he would do is he would just pour himself into uh, the work that he was doing around him and he began to neglect his wife and his family. Because when he would go and he would get compliments and things, it made him feel confident, there's that word again, confident in what God had created for him. Now, the fear that I believe that woman deals with that goes all the way back there, correct me if I'm wrong, but could not have God destroyed Eve and started all over again? when that sin had occurred there in the garden. I believe the fear, the, the, the innate fear that women deal with the most is the fear of being replaced. And I've watched couples as they go through difficult times and I see that these two fears begin to feed off of one another. The husband will uh, oftentimes become involved, I don't know, uh, and please don't misunderstand me, I don't have anything against Little League Baseball or, or sports or things, but a lot of times what a young man will do is he'll start pouring himself into some kind of activity like that because guess what, when he goes and he coaches those kids, everybody come over, oh, you're doing such a wonderful job with my son, or you're doing such a wonderful job with my, and he gets all kind of compliments and it makes him feel worthy. It makes him feel important. And so he spends more time, he gravitates toward that. And so what happens with the, uh, with the girl, she begins to feel like she's been replaced. And so she begins to uh, voice her objections to what is happening. And so what happens, then he starts feeling like, well, gee, all I ever get when I'm at home here uh, is argumentation and trouble. And so I'm going to go. And so they feed off of one another. And it all, sin is real is my point and it does desert, uh, deceive you it does destroy you and it will no doubt denounce you secondly man makes little of sin I, I think we could all agree with that as well Proverbs the 28th chapter verse 13 says he that covereth his, his sins shall not prosper but whoso confesses and forsake them shall have mercy this whole idea of confessing and, and, and getting rid of the guilt that we build inside of ourselves as a result of sin, uh, uh, it, it, it comes from uh, just dealing with the feelings that we have of guilt in relationship to that. Think about it in the secular world. What is the first thing that when oftentimes you go to a secular type psychologist or counselor, uh, and, and you're just really dealing with uh, an enormous amount of, of guilt on the inside, the first thing they start trying to do is they try to start finding someone that they can place the blame for that guilt on. Rather than dealing with the guilt, they place, uh, try to place blame. Uh, did you have a good relationship with your mother? Uh, what was your relationship with your father? They start trying to place blame. And it's like a, you remember, uh, uh, well, uh, I think most of us in here remember the teeter-totters, right? And, and, and so what they do is they try to balance that guilt with blame. And so they start trying to find who can you in your life place the blame over the guilt that is occurring in your life. Now, I don't know about you, but... I used to love to get somebody on the teeter-totter and, and wait until they got up there real high uh, and then jump off and watch them crash as they come down. And oftentimes, that's what happens. I wasn't a real bad kid when I was little. I mean, you know, just mischievous. Um, uh, but, you know, the, you watch and you see that guilt just literally crash down like that teeter-totter when they can't find blame when in fact the thing we need to do is deal with that guilt and dealing with the guilt guilt comes from what we've mentioned here in proverbs the 28th chapter verse 13. we we if we cover our sins will not prosper but whosoever confesseth and forsake them shall have mercy if we don't deal with the guilt we come close to destroying our, uh, uh, our relationships. We come uh, close to destroying our confidence in ourselves. We come close to um, uh, actually 
deterring being able to break away from our past, to put our past behind us. It's always interests me how oftentimes we can come to the altar of God and we can confess our sin and we can say, Lord, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, forgive me of this and, and allow me to move forward in my life. Uh, and then, I don't know, it's almost like sometime we walk about two or three steps away and we turn around and we say, hey, come on back with me again. When God has said, if you have truly confessed that sin, then it's vanished as far as what? The east is from the west. It's no longer uh, red like crimson. It's white as snow. And we need to uh, understand that to, to get through our life, oftentimes we need to confess it. And that verse in the 28th chapter of Proverbs 13 says uh, that if we will confess it, we will find mercy. And yet we continue in the way that we go. But, you know, if God, I mean, if man does not uh, make uh, much of sin at all, makes little of sin, the fact of the matter is, and I think, again, we'll all agree with this, God makes much of it, right? Ezekiel, the 18th chapter, verse number 20 says, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. In the book of Ezekiel, they were dealing with this uh, uh, concept or this idea in this particular chapter uh, that uh, the uh, consequences of sin comes upon the, uh, the son for the father's sins. And so um, uh, Ezekiel, uh, speaking through the inspiration of God, had said, no, no, that's not the case. Whatever, whoever has committed the sin, they're the one that's held accountable. And he was clear and he said, the soul that sinneth shall die. And so Deuteronomy 25th verse, chapter verse 16 says, For all that do such things and all that do unrighteously are an abomination unto the Lord. God considers sin much. And man considers it little. In fact, as we see in Romans the 6th chapter, verse 23, I'm sure all of you are familiar with that one. For the wages of sin is death. What a scary thought that is. I had the opportunity, as I mentioned during our Bible study this morning, our pastor uh, took me on a, a tour of the cemetery and I was able to um, uh, just to feel the heartaches of, of uh, uh, and I know this kind of sounds morbid, but when we go out of town a lot of times and traveling, I like to, uh, if there's a cemetery around, I like to just walk through because you can learn so much uh, from just looking at the tombstones and seeing the um, thing. There was a, uh, and maybe some of you um, know this family right off the, uh, I'm sure some of you here do, but there was a family uh, by the name of Newtons, N-E-W-T-O-N. And Pastor and I was standing there and we just became heavy hearted in thinking what this family had gone through. Beginning on the right side, and then there was six little small tombstones right in a row. And we begin to look at the dates and we begin to realize that beginning in 1899, living for one year, this little baby passed. And then we looked over and in 1991, another child, one year lived just basically one year. And so we got intrigued and just began to look and sure, from 1899 all the way to 1907, this family experienced birth, and death of little children that was hardly a year old each time. And my heart just said, and I thought, wow, what, what uh, trials, what tribulations that that uh, uh, family certainly uh, went through. But there's one thing that is evident anytime we go to walk in the graves, in the graveyards, and in the cemeteries. And that one thing is, death is real, right? In fact, uh, uh, um, we were hearing this morning, uh, Jim was sharing with us of a friend of his that uh, uh, has lung cancer and, and, uh, and was told that uh, you're, you're dying. The fact of the matter is what? We're all dying. We all have an appointment with death. 
And so uh, it, it's something for us to consider. And so, uh, just, uh, so it was announced in the Garden of Eden. Let's just say that. The love of God was announced there in the Garden of Eden. Even in the midst of the sin that had occurred there, God promised us a way in which we could go uh, uh, and survive through that time through His Son, Jesus Christ. And we can praise Him for that announcement there in the Garden. But not only was it announced in the Garden, it was actualized, and I love this, in the Bethlehem manger. It, when you think about it, when Jesus came into the world, uh, we, we, we had an opportunity then to put our full and complete faith in the grace of an almighty, holy God. In fact, uh, if we were to just think about the whole idea of faith as something that, um, uh, you know, it, it interests me. We're rapidly approaching now the time of the year where there's going to be a lot of emphasis uh, being placed on the birth of our Lord. Uh, and I have no doubt that there's probably going to be some TV programs that's going to pop up that's going to be searching for the historical birth of Jesus. And... Um, when I see those, I, I, I get interested, I, and a lot of times I'll just say, okay, so what, are you, what, what direction do you go in to find uh, the facts behind the historical uh, existence of Jesus, little baby Jesus? You know the thing that interests me? I never hear one time any mention of the four Gospels of the New Testament. Let me, let me just, uh, uh, unless you realize this, you are not going to find anything that is true, factual, historical events about our Lord and His birth and His life apart from God's Word. It's just, uh, you know, you, I mean, that is where we go to learn of the historical Jesus. And yet all of these programs that you see oftentimes, uh, very seldom ever, or they will maybe briefly mention that, but in the context that, uh, well, it is said that in the Bible, this and that. But let me tell you something. Jesus is real. Not only is he real, he is the son of God. Remember in the book of Matthew, the 16th chapter, verse 13. And let me say something here. In order for us to deal with that guilt of the sin that's so heavily upon us, in order for us to do that, we have got to, and I'll go ahead and say it. Now, follow through with me until the end here, because all three of these things are imperative if we're going to be able to rid ourselves of the guilt of sin. Uh, we've got to come to a point in our mind where we believe Jesus Christ did live on this earth intellectually. And oftentimes people will get to that point, but they'll not go any further. And, and uh, there's, uh, it, it, as we consider the intellectual part of it, we have to come to the point where we understand and believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Remember, it was in the Matthew, the 16th chapter, uh, where uh, Jesus had came to the disciples and said, who do, who do people say that I am? And oh, they had all kinds of answers. And then he finally looks and he says, but who do you say that I am? And remember, it was good old Peter. And I've told you before, I love Peter. I love studying Peter. I mean, uh, you know, it, it's, um, I, I still believe that uh, he puts his sandals on like I put my shoes on this morning. He is, he, he uh, you know, and, and so he speaks out and says, hey, I can tell you, I, you know, I, I could almost see him. Let me answer. Let me answer. I know that answer. And he said, thou art the son of the, and I love this part of it, the son of the living God. And it was after that statement that Jesus looked back and said, Peter, you're right on track. And upon that, I will build my church. And I thank God that Beulah Baptist Church Winter Garden states strongly upon the truth that he is the Son of God. We will allow... We will allow Jesus to build this church. 
If we do it any other way, it's done in vain. And so we're going to continue that. Jeff was just a little side track. That's so, but okay, so Jesus is the Son of God. I'm, in fact, I, I love it because uh, in that portion of the scripture, remember Thomas said, hey, we want to follow you, uh, Jesus, Lord, uh, but we don't know the way. So, hey. And remember what Jesus' response was? I am what? The way, the truth, and the life. You know, I'm studying that, it, it, you know, it, it, there's so much more deep truth in that. The fact of the matter is, Jesus does not just show us the way. He is the way. He said it, right? He doesn't just show us the way. He is the way. He does not show us truth. He is the truth. He does not just uh, give us life. He is life. And so we come to that realization as we look at that intellectual part of the saving grace of God. So, uh, you know, there's, there's also got to be, if there's intellectual, there's also got to be an emotional side. And again, bear with me here. Uh, each one of these pieces are, are absolute uh, imperative to be together. There is the emotional side. Saving faith is emotional. In fact... Here's a statement. The world is a sinful place. And one of the Holy Spirit's tasks is to convict the world of sin. Now listen to this. No amount of preaching, pleading, or pointing fingers will bring about the conviction of sin unless the Holy Spirit is at work in the sinner's heart. There's got to come a point where we may believe everything intellectually about Jesus, but there's got to come to a point to, in our own lives where we emotionally feel the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, didn't Jesus even say uh, that he, uh, if he was going away, that he was going to send a comforter, right? And in the um, uh, and and that comforter would be one that would uh, convict of sin, reprove the world of it, of righteousness and justice. Not only is it emotional, but it's also volitional. Saving faith is volitional. I remember the story as Paul stood before Phoebus and 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 King Agrippa. Uh, remember, as he poured his heart out. King Agrippa said, I'm going to give you a few minutes, Paul, to, uh, to just share what you think. Would share, just go ahead, I'm going to give you. And at some point or another, Phoebus uh, uh, just throws his hands up and, and literally says, Paul, you are crazy. Your learning, your much learning has just made you absolutely crazy. And Paul looked back at him and said, oh, no, I'm not crazy either. And then he looks over at King Agrippa and he says, and I think you realize that, King Agrippa. And then remember the words? He looked at King Agrippa and he said, King Agrippa, believest thou these things? And the most heart-wrenching response that I think we could ever consider this morning was the words that came back from King Agrippa. Remember? Almost. Almost, Paul, thou hast persuadest me. What a heart-wrenching thought that we would be presented with the truth of God's word and come that close to accepting it and then go off into eternity without Christ. So it was accomplished at the cross of Calvary. We saw it was announced in the garden. We saw it was actualized there in the uh, manger scene at Bethlehem. And then let's go now to the uh, cross of Calvary where it was accomplished. That love that God extended unto us, it was accomplished. And all loving God turned his back. Now think about this. And all loving God turned his back on his son as the sin of the world was poured out on him. You remember in Mark, the 15th chapter, verse 34, that's where uh, Jesus is hanging there on the cross. And, and, and let me just say this before 
alluding to this verse here. I've often said that the sins of the world was poured upon the back of our Lord in that instance. But it went even far beyond that. It wasn't just the sins of the world were poured upon the back of our Lord. Jesus literally became sin for you and for me. You catch all of that? He came, he, he didn't just take on our, he, he came, he became sin that we might have eternal life. That's the kind of love that God the Father had that he would allow this to happen to his own son. Remember there in Mark the 15th chapter verse 34 is where Jesus there on the cross cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani? And as you look at that, I don't know if you've ever thought about it before or not, but this is the only instance that we're given where Jesus did not refer to him as his father. At this point, there was a separation that had occurred. Was he still God's son? Absolutely. He was just as much God's son at that point uh, 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 as, as my own son would be, as he uh, would do things that was wrong. Uh, it didn't make him not my son anymore. He was my son. He was just wrong. And in this instance, as God looked down and Jesus was become the sin of the people, Jesus cried out in his loneliness and his desperation, Oh my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And the clear answer to that is, he did it for me and for you. And what a, what a thought that that is for us and what a, uh, an assurance it is. It, it's, it's, uh, 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 as we consider, we need to look toward, okay, so what can we do with this that has been announced in the, uh, uh, in the garden and actualized there uh, in, the, um, uh, in the Bethlehem manger? And, and, and so how can we then uh, deal with this that was accomplished there at Calvary and it all begins? And you might ask yourself the question, as you look around you, uh, there's probably a uh, few of you that have not accepted Christ as your personal Savior that is here this morning. But if there's just one here today that has not, I want to be sure we're clear on how can we deal with this. How can we rid ourselves of the guilt of sin? How can, we, how can we turn to a holy, almighty God? And it all begins first with turning from sin to God. The one term, repentance. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 9 and 10 says, uh, uh, Godly sorrow or grief leads to repentance. And so as we begin to grieve and as we begin to recognize the condition that we are in because of the sin that we have committed, and we begin to earnestly start trying to deal with the guilt of it and the feelings that we have, God says, I've provided a way for you. Repent and be thou saved. But it has to start, begin, I mean, it might begin with that repentance, but it also has to be accepted, doesn't it? I mean, if I were to, and I'm not going to do it this morning, but if I were, if I had a $20 bill in my pocket, I'd maybe take a $20 bill out and, and I'd hold it up and say, hey, I've got a gift for anybody that'll come and take it. When does it become a gift? When we receive it. When we accept it. I can stand here and hold it all night long or all day long. And it's not a gift until you receive it. And that's exactly when Jesus gave the invitation to us to be cleansed of our sin because of what had taken place there at Calvary. Uh, it was a gift. In fact, the scripture tells us that. That the wages of sin is death, but the gift is what? Eternal life through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And then we accept it and we go a step further and we, we confess it. We go forward and tell the world what has happened in our life. I remember as a little fifth grader uh, back at Maple Street Elementary School in College Park, Georgia, sits about where 
I think Concourse B of the Atlanta airport sits now. But I do remember a godly, godly fifth grade teacher. Yes, that's back when we would, uh, on a daily basis, pledge the allegiance to the American flag. And then there was someone that would be appointed to read scripture. This was a public school, by the way. And, and we would literally read scripture. And this Mrs. White was her name. Godly lady. Um, and uh, uh, you know, I was about to tell a story about one of the instances where she led me in the right uh, direction. But uh, I'll not do that this morning. Uh, you know, they say confession is good for the soul, but sometimes it hurts the testimony. So I won't tell you, you know, the full story other than to just say that she took me apart. She was, uh, our class was in the library of the school and, and there was this little room in the backside and, and, uh, and, and I had gotten uh, uh, a little more mischievous than what I should have done. And uh, so she took me back and, and she shared with me from her heart and show me, not just on the surface, but down deep, what I had done was wrong. And I remember as a fifth grader, and I think I've shared uh, with you before, I remember uh, going to a revival service and standing back there on that back pew in the revival service, hanging on to that pew just as tight as I could, uh, all the way through about the 15th or 16th verse of Just As I Am. And I remember finally when I let go of that pew, and I said, you know what? I'm going to make this right. You know, one of the first ones that I couldn't wait to tell about my decision was that fifth grade teacher. Why? Because she had went forward in her own life and had confessed the Lord Jesus to those around her, not only with her words, but with her actions. Matthew, the 10th chapter, verse 32 says, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before him, men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. The whole summary of what the Lord has laid on my heart today is that I think we as Mature Christians. And as I look around, I see for the most part, most of you, if not all of you, have made a decision for Christ. But I think sometimes we become complacent in exactly what God did for us. In providing for us that salvation. I think sometimes we become so, uh, uh, what's the word, comfortable with our Christian walk that we fail to do like that fifth grade teacher did. We fail to take opportunities when the opportunities arise to share Christ with those that we come in contact with. Romans the 10th chapter verse nine says very clearly, if we'll confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead. What does the rest of that verse say? Thy shalt be saved. If you're here this morning and you have not made that decision for Christ, I beseech you even as Paul beseeched the church of Rome to present yourself a living sacrifice to the one that so loved us that he sent his only begotten son that we might have eternal life. What an awesome God it is that we serve. Perhaps there's somebody here this morning and you're right in the middle of those four D's and some kind of activity that you're participating in. Maybe you're real close to convincing yourself, well, this activity's not really that bad. That's the first step that Satan will use against you. And if you aren't careful, he'll have you at the point where you totally deny the truth of God. And when that happens, the only next step is disobedience before God. I encourage you this morning, 
understand the peace that comes by unloading the guilt of sin in your life and in my life. Recently, I had an opportunity to share these very words with someone. Something that had happened in their life and, 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 and it was just so heavy upon them. But once that confession takes place and we genuinely leave it at the foot of the cross, I'm talking genuinely leave it there because if we have genuinely confessed it, God removes it, as we said a few moments ago, as far as the east is from the west, leave it at the foot of the cross and move forward in your life for Christ. Would you do that this morning? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. And Father God, we do thank you for the blessed privilege that we have of knowing such a great salvation as you have given unto us. Lord, a peace that surpasses all understanding. Father, I pray in every single action every single moment in the life of Beulah Baptist Church Winter Garden, the Lord will ever put before us the truth, the love of God, and the doctrine of salvation that you have given unto us. And Father, every activity that we have, every effort that we put forward, may it be bathed with that evermore in mind. You loved us, so loved us, that you gave your only son. Father God, we lift our hands in praise to all that you've done. In just a moment, Lord, we're going to sing a beautiful hymn that I can remember standing in the pews before with this song playing and the convicting power of the Holy Spirit coming upon my own life. As those words ring out softly and tenderly, Jesus is calling, calling us home. Lord, may we bow before you this day in humble adoration and praise for what you have done. In Jesus' precious and holy name, amen.